Welcome to class. Uh, thank you for joining uh, class to Bega and Jeffina. Um, also, a warm welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. And uh, welcome to the class on Romans. Hope you're enjoying the study, learning um, some profound truths, revelations that the Holy Spirit has revealed, uh, had revealed to the Apostle Paul. Um, before we continue studying uh, chapter 7, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So can can I ask uh, Jeffina to lead us in prayer, please? Jeffina, will you please lead us? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the class we are about to have. God, uh, I just give Pastor Selena in their hands. I bless her in the name of Jesus as she's teaching the deep truths from the Bible. God, I just pray that you'll help us to open our heart and mind and listen to it and be fully convinced about your word so that uh, we can put it into practice in this life and we can be a blessing to others. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So um, last week, uh, we began studying or, uh, sorry, on Monday, we also began looking at Romans chapter 7. Um, we were looking at this uh, uh, subsection, verses 7 to verse 12, it's the law bad. And so we uh, see that in these verses, Paul is addressing um, in verses 7 to verse 12, he's addressing the whole aspect of the law. Uh, he has just told us that the Jewish, um, he has just told the Jewish believers that, you know, they are no longer under the law. They are free from the law uh, because they are now part of the body of Christ. They are married to another, which means they're married to Christ. Now they're part of the body of Christ and they are also serving God in the newness of the uh, spirit. So he's asking basically a rhetorical question here. Um, in verse 7, is the law sin? And, um, you know, he's saying the problem, uh, uh, is there a problem with the law? And then he says, certainly not. The problem is not with the law. Um, you know, as he concludes in verse 12, he says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. So the problem is not the law. The problem is because um, of the law, sin became very powerful, which means that, you know, now uh, you and I know that there is something called sin. And then, you know, um, we realize that uh, we can't free ourselves from uh, this thing called sin, even though we try our best uh, to do the things that we don't want to do. We end up doing the things that we, you know, uh, don't want to do. Or even if we try to do the things that we want to do, we don't do the things that we want to do, but we end up doing the things that we don't want to do. And so he's saying that, you know, the problem is not the law. Uh, but the problem is that because of the law, sin became very powerful, which means he's saying that I knew that there is something called sin. And then I realized that I couldn't free myself from this thing called uh, sin. And the law highlighted my weakness against sin. That means that the law highlighted that I can't keep the law. I always break the law. I'm incapable of keeping uh, the law. And so the, uh, the law highlighted uh, my weakness towards sin or my weakness against sin. And we see in this passage a very interesting thing that Paul points out or says in verse 9. He says, you know, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And, uh, you know, um, uh, so he's saying, you know, sin re revived and he uh, uh, he died. So this is a very uh, challenging verse for many to understand. And um, I tried explaining this, and this is where we stopped um, um, uh, 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 on Monday. In this verse, Paul is referring uh, to himself. And when was Paul in the state and how do we understand this verse correctly uh, to the best of our understanding uh, is, you know, uh, the best person to ask is 
Apostle Paul himself, and because he's not here, you know, the Holy Spirit can help us. Uh, when he says that he was without the law, or he did not have the understanding of the law, or he did not have an understanding of what is good and right, or what is right and wrong, he says that he, you know, uh, he uh, had this... Uh, and this is not a stage of life where he was after he was born again, where, uh, you know, he did not have an understanding of what is right and wrong and all of those things. It was before he uh, had an encounter with Jesus on the road to um, Damascus. And he says he did not know what he had to uh, submit to. So, uh, you know, I said that I'm going to share something that is uh, definitive, but... Uh, uh, you know, it is indicative as well that at the age of 12, just to understand what Paul is trying to say here, you know, the age of 12 people um, uh, or age of 12 or 13, you know, young people can understand uh, commandments. Now, children know what is right and wrong, but the age of 12, they come to a place of, uh, you know, accountability to those commandments or the rules or, uh, uh, you know, laws that have been uh, laid out. They come to a place of accountability. They come to a place where they're able to see the bigger picture. Yes, that there is a God that, you know, when they break a law or they sin, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, not getting some rewards or perks or, uh, you know, receiving punishment. Uh, but they come to a place where, uh, you know, they understand that the commandments or the rules or the law has to do with God. And what is that exact age? The age can vary. Most people say it's 12 or uh, 13. So uh, Paul is saying in verse 9 that when Paul came to an understanding of the law, he knew he was accountable to the standards of the Law. He came to a place or to an age where he was able to understand that, you know, it was not just about keeping the law. It was not just about you know, when you break the law, you will receive all of these uh, curses. When you keep the law, you will receive all of these blessings. But he came to an understanding of the law. He knew he was accountable to the standards of, a law, he, of the law. He came to a place where he understood that the law had to do with God, or he came to a place where he understood the commandments as having to do with God. So when he understood this, he says that sin revived and he died, which means um, there was no way to overcome sin. He understood that. He realized that there was no way he could overcome sin. And sin had taken such a hold of him, there's no way he could overcome it. And he says, I died which means he's saying that the sin has taken such a hold of him and there's no way he can overcome that sin and that sin has brought about decay and corruption and is destroying uh, his life. And uh, we, we read in verse 8, he says, when the understanding of the commandment came, the awareness of uh, uh, of sin came. So he says, when the understanding of the commandment came, the awareness of sin came. So what is sin? It is basically the violation of the Lord's breaking of the commandments. So Paul is saying that sin produced in him all manner of evil desire. So Paul saw that in him all kinds of wrong desires uh, that are contrary to the law is just raging, is just so evident in his life, in his body. And he says, only when the law was presented to him that he, he realized that he was uh, sinning. Not only did he realize that he was sinning, but he also realized that sin was at work in him, or sin was at work in the, against the members of his body. And he also realized that, that all manner of evil desires were in him as a result of him sinning, which was causing him to break the law and causing him to um, sin. Okay, So this is what he, he mentions in uh, verses 7 to verse um, um, uh, 
12. So as we progress in his, or he, as Paul writes his letter, and he progresses in his letter, or as we read verses 13 to 25, he now focuses uh, not just on the law, but the sin. He's talking about the sinful, evil desires in the person in verses uh, 13 to verse 25. So uh, we'll read verses 13 to 25, and then we would... Um, and I'll look at what Paul is trying to say, or we'll understand what Paul is saying. Um, any questions so far? Verses 7 to 12? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move to verses 13 to 25. Can somebody please read verses 13 to 25? Romans chapter 7, verse 13 to 25. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, uh, what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present within me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my men and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So in verses 13 to 25, Paul uh, describes his struggle. Paul has already mentioned to us that the law highlighted sin, but the problem is not with the law because he says the law is holy it's spiritual it's just it's um right okay we read this also in verse um, uh, verse 12 he says therefore the law is holy the commandment is holy and it is just and um, good so uh, we see that the the problem is not with the law but the prob the problem is there is sin and sin he says is working in my flesh through my natural desires okay so the problem is sin and sin that is working in his flesh in his fleshly desires and through his natural desires so in these verses we basically see the struggle that paul is going through he says you know i want to do what is right but i don't do it you know i desire to please god but i don't do it and why is that he says uh, because he says in verse 21 he says i find then a law that evil is present with me the one who wills to do good okay so he says he finds a law a law here is not the old testament law that god gave uh, moses and the israelites but he's saying this law is something that is controlling me you know something that is is dominating me something that is powerful that is uh, controlling me okay and having a control over my life and he's saying it is the evil that is present in me this evil in verse 23 he says but i see another law in my members that means i see another force or uh, 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 something that is controlling me or dominating me in my members is basically he's talking about his body you know warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity 
to the law of sin which is in my members. The, all of these words is not talking, when you read law, it's not here talking about the Old Testament law, but it is the law means a controlling factor, a, a, a overpowering uh, factor, something that is um, uh, that is they uh, they have been enslaved to, that is you know pinning them down, that is controlling um, them. So he's saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, I want to desire to please God. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Why is that? Because he says, I find a law, something that is controlling me, dominating me, you know, uh, is so overpowering. And it is an evil that is present in me. And he says, this evil in verse 23 is keeping the members in my body enslaved to sin, even though in my mind I want to obey God. So he's saying, I desire to obey God and in my mind, I desire that, but you know, I am so enslaved to think be, uh, to sin because the law of sin um, uh, is controlling me. There's a law that is really controlling me and enslaving me and pinning me down to uh, this whole aspect of sin. And then in verse 24 it says, "Who will deliver me from this body of death?" So why is he calling it a body of death? Because you know, sin is reigning in his body, and sin, you know, what does sin produce? Sin produces death. He's already spoken about it. He says the wages of sin is uh, death, but the gift of uh, God is uh, eternal life in Christ Jesus. So the life that Jesus gives is eternal um, life. So he's calling it a body of death, which means that sin is so controlling him, so warring against the uh, members of his body, so enslaved to sin, and hence sin is going to produce um, death. And in verse 13, um, he talks about how sin produces death. And he says, the more he sins, the more you know it's producing uh, death. His body has become a body of death. Why? Because it is being controlled by uh, sin. The more he's going to let his body to be dominated, controlled, overpowered by sin, uh, the sin that you know that is controlling him is producing death and is at work in his body so what is the death that he's talking about here it's not just you know the final uh, painful death but is talking about you know there is corruption there is decay there is sin there is the sickness there is pain there is uh, suffering and futility uh, because uh, why is this happening in his body or why is he facing all of this is because sin the law of sin that is in his body or the law of sin that is controlling um, him okay so verses 13 to 25 uh, you know is descriptive of uh, uh, is this descriptive of paul as a believer or as paul as a man under the law before becoming a believer so this is a question, and you know uh, many of them are debating on this. They're basically saying, "Hey, this is uh, what Paul is writing after he became a believer, after he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus." And many of them say it cannot be uh, descriptive of Paul as a believer because Paul already has mentioned very detailed, uh, uh, detailly in uh, Romans chapter six that you know, "Hey, we are dead to sin." You know, once we are in Christ Jesus, once we are married to Christ, once we are part of the body of Christ, you know, sin has no control over us. Uh, we are dead to sin. The power of sin over our lives is uh, broken. So, you know, in, in that context, they say that, you know, what Paul is basically writing here in chapter 7 is not descriptive of him, you know, after he becomes a believer, but it is before he is a believer so uh because of this you know many believers quote these verses to describe their struggle with sin and they say hey look at paul when paul himself struggled with sin you know i also So there's no way out because even Paul suffered. So it's okay, you know, if I uh, don't do what is good, if I end up doing what, giving up to my own evil um, desires or sinful, lustful uh, passions. 
So I just want to, um, you know, point out to a couple of things. The first one is that Paul is talking of him when he was under the law and not when he, you know, became a believer or when he um, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. So it's not talking of him when, uh, when he was a believer, but it's talking of him when he was under the law. So we we also saw this in verse 9. He says, when the commandment came, means when I came to know the law, sin revived in me, sin came up in me, and I died. And this was his experience when he was under the law. And he says that sin, I died to sin, which means, you know, anything that decays, corrupts, and destroys is, uh, in this context, is referring to I died or death. The second thing is he concludes by saying, you know, um, this passage of his uh, letter or this portion of this uh, letter in verse 25, he says, I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord, meaning that he's, you know, pointing to the way. He says, hey, you know, I feel trapped. Uh, you know, about the way I'm feeling, you know, about how I'm bound to sin and slave to sin. There's no way the law of sin is, you know, has such a dominating force over me, control over me. I feel trapped, but, you know, um, this is the way out. There is a way out. And he's saying, uh, he's not saying, I took the way out and came to the other side and found myself trapped, which means he's not saying, hey, I was in the law, and I felt so bound by the law, I knew I couldn't keep the law, and I felt so enslaved to the law because the law highlighted a uh, sin in my life. And now, you know, I, I, I took the way out and I came out to the other side and I feel trapped. No, he can't say that because he says, you know, um, Oh, when we are in Christ Jesus, sin has no longer control or power or authority over us. But he says, I'm under the law and I'm trapped because I want to do the right things that the law is telling me, but I find sin is controlling my body. And then he says, how can I get rid of the sin that is controlling my desires? And then he points the way out and he says that is Jesus Christ is the way out. So he's not feeling trapped in sin or enslaved to sin. You know, after he's found the way out, after he's found the way to salvation, and then he's saying, hey, I continue to feel trapped in this sin, continue to feel enslaved in sin. No, it's not. He's saying that, you know, when he was under the law, you know, before he came into Christ Jesus, before he became part of the body of Christ, he says, you know, I was under the law, I, I was trapped. Why does he feel trapped? Because he says, I want to do the right things that the law is telling me, but I find sin is controlling my body. And he says, how can I get rid of the sin that's controlling my desires? And then he's pointing out the way out, and he's saying the way out is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the answer uh, for us to be freed from the law of sin, which means the bondage or the stronghold or the dominating force or the control of um, sin and that is why i say that you know um, that the experience that paul is writing about in this chapter and more specifically in verses 13 to 25 does not apply to him as a believer because um, the believer is now on the other side and um, and Paul is basically talking about his experience when he was under the law before coming to uh, Jesus. So some people don't see it as we see it. And I'm, I'm just sharing this uh, with you. But you are free to take your position. You are free to take what you, know, you feel comfortable after reading Romans chapter 7. And from your understanding uh, of, of this study, you can take your stand whether Paul is talking about his life when he was, you know, in uh, when he was under the law, when he uh, when he was not under Christ, or you know, you can understand this chapter as uh, Paul was is mentioning that how he suffered when he was under the law, but he feels so trapped, but he finds a way out, and that is the way out is Jesus. Uh, Christ. So 
uh, Paul is basically here talking about himself as a, a good Jewish person, you know, um, who wants to keep the law, who loves the law, you know, who is zealous for the law, uh, but he says he cannot do it because, you know, he cannot keep the law without the power of Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now there are two things that we have to deal with here. Uh, the law has already been dealt with, uh, and he says we are dead to the law and we are married to Christ, but... Um, uh, uh, the law of sin and death or the law of death is still at work in our body, which means the dominating controlling force uh, of the law of sin and the law of death. But there is still the law of sin and the law of death. And he says in verse 9, sin revived and I died. And, you know, um, uh, and sin is producing death in me, verse 13. Uh, so death here, again, you know, talking about decay, corruption, and something that destroys. So he's saying, ultimately, there is the physical um, and, you know, the spiritual death. But he says, verse 7, sin dwells in me. And he says, verse 23, the law of sin, which is in the members in my body, which means uh, the control of sin in my body. And what is the result? Verse 24, he says, the body of death, the sin in my body is causing my body to uh, die. And he says, the law of sin, the control of sin is causing my body to uh, die. So what I'm pointing out here in these verses is Paul is saying that there are two problems here. There is sin and there is death. So he's asking the question, who is going to set me free from the sin that is controlling my flesh? and is ultimately producing death in me. And he says, who is going to deliver me? Now I'm going out, uh, who is going to deliver me? And he says, now I'm going to come out of this. And how is he going to come out of this? You know, he's pointing to uh, Jesus Christ. Now, why is this important in the light of what Paul has already said in Romans chapter six? Uh, there is one connecting Point. Uh, we read this in Romans chapter 6, verse 19. He says, I'm speaking to you because of the weakness of the flesh. So he says there is a weakness in the flesh of a believer. And what is it? He says, sin is at work and sin is producing death. And sin, if it is allowed to continue in the flesh, it will still produce death. So while the believer is, you know, set free, Plea uh, from this law of sin, from this dominion of sin, this bondage of sin, this control of sin, how does he walk free from sin that produces death in the flesh? And then he goes on to uh, talk about this in chapter 8, where he says, you know, it is the Holy Spirit that, you know, gives us the freedom that helps us to overcome and walk, help us to walk free uh, from sin that produces death in the flesh, okay? So this is what he's basically trying to um, say in these verses um, where he's saying, hey, you know, now I have, uh, how I was living under the law, what the law did to me, you know, what was the control of the law of sin and death and how I'm struggling. But now since I have come out, I found a way out, I've come out of it, you know, and um, uh, I'm part of the body of Christ. But there is still that weakness in the flesh of a believer. And what is that? That sin is at work and sin is producing death. And if sin is allowed to continue in the flesh, it will still produce death. So how can a believer be set free? Or how can a believer walk in this freedom from sin that produces death in the flesh? Uh, he gives us the answer in chapter 8 where he talks about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So very beautifully, uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, he talks about um, um, how the Holy Spirit helps us and how the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome the weakness in the uh, flesh.
So that is uh, Romans chapter 7, where he talks about his struggles. Uh, verse 17, he says, what I'm doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, I do not practice. That, uh, that I do not practice what I hate, that I do. What uh, I want to do good, but I, I may unable to do it. Uh, verse 18, then he says, the good that I will to do, I do not do it. Verse 19, and the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And then he also talks about the problem uh, in these verses. He says, sin dwells in me. Verse 17, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Verse 18, um, sin that dwells in me. Verse 20, and the evil that is present in me. Verse 20. One. So he says, something is ruling in the members of my body, fighting against my mind, bringing me to captivity to sin, verse 23. Uh, okay. So that is what he is uh, presenting here. And then he goes on to talk about uh, how Jesus is our deliverer. And he thanks uh, God uh, for the answer that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, okay, uh, and how you know um, while he knew that his mind in his mind that he is controlled by sin, but he says while I know that in my mind I'm submitted to God's rule, I'm aware that there is law of sin or the rule or dominion of sin in my flesh, but God has an answer how to get rid of this law of sin and the death that it produces, and uh, he presents that to us in Romans chapter 8. So any questions on in this chapter, Romans chapter 7? Any questions? Yeah, uh, just so that uh, Pastor can explain the last verse one more time again as it says uh we serve the law of sin over here we understand that uh as you said he he talked it before he knew uh even he was under the law right but then uh i think in the last verse he knew jesus in 25 thank god to jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of god but with flesh the law of sin so just one more review of the last verse okay so here, uh, he's basically what he's saying is there are two problems here. There is sin and there is death. And he's saying, who's going to set me free from sin that is controlling my flesh and that is ultimately producing death means decay and, you know, distress and pain and suffering and all of those things. So he's saying, who's going to deliver me and who's going to help me to come out of um, this? So... Uh, what is his whole uh, agony or cry or his desperation is that he's speaking about the weakness in the uh, flesh, the weakness of the flesh of a believer. And uh, what is that weakness of the flesh that is, you know, that sin is at work, you know. Uh, we are born again in our spirit man, but in our uh, flesh, uh, you know, our, our flesh uh, our, our, or our soul and... Um, um, uh, our minds need to be renewed daily. In our spirit man, we have been born again, but in our in our mind and in our body, you know, uh, sin is still at work. Uh, uh, and you know, the weak there's weakness of the flesh, and the the flesh tends to desire to give in to sin, to give in to sinful um, passions. And so he's saying that even as sin is still at work. You know, it is producing death, and if it is allowed to, you know, it will continue to produce death, which means, you know, you know, all of the the consequences as a result uh, that comes because we sin. And so he says, now, how do I overcome this? You know, I know that uh, I'm no longer under the law. I know that I am uh, part of the body of Christ. I know that I'm dead to sin. But even as I know that I'm dead to sin, but there is this weakness in my flesh, that tendency that pulls me or drives me towards, you know, doing things that I don't want to do. And I want to desire to do the things that pleases God, but I find myself 
self at times doing things that I don't want to do. So, you know, how do I walk free from uh, the sin that produces death in my flesh? And he says, it is the person and the work of the Holy um, uh, Spirit. It is by walking the Spirit, living the Spirit, you know, abiding in the Spirit. Um, and, you know, um, uh, no, uh, when we uh, desire the things of the Spirit, we don't gratify the desires of the flesh but when we gratify the desires of our flesh we cannot please the holy spirit so we see that paul also talks about you know how there is a war that is happening uh with the carnal nature and the spirit filled nature so you know he talks about how the more we keep feeding our uh, our spirit man, our spirit man keeps growing and that is starving our carnal nature. But he says when, you know, when you keep feeding our carnal nature, how our spirit man is starved and that keeps pushing, the carnal nature pushes it down and what is controlling us is our carnal nature. So he's saying, you know, how do uh, I have this problem? I'm free from sin. I know I'm dead to sin, but you know, uh, there is weakness in my flesh because there's a tendency to go towards that. But who can free me from that uh, uh, weakness in my flesh, that tendency towards sin that is producing death in my flesh? And uh, that is what he talks in, uh, goes on to uh, elaborate or discuss and uh, explain to us in chapter 8. Did that help now, Jefina? Yes, boss. Because he says the answer is Jesus Christ. Yeah, and uh, I understand that. Mm. Only the last sentence when he says, uh, with the flesh, uh, so he says, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So does it say, when we connect it, it says, like, I serve with my flesh the law of sin, right? Is mm. so what is the meaning of the law of sin? The law of sin means the controlling, dominating power of sin that is working in his, uh, in his flesh, in his carnal nature. What is the law of God? It means the dominating, controlling, the power of God that is working in his uh, spirit man. Okay, so he's saying there is this law of God and there is this law of sin, sin. the controlling, dominating power. So I want to do things that pleases God in my mind or in, in my mind when he's talking about the mind is basically talking about the spirit uh, man, you know, but he's saying in the flesh, uh, you know, I have this weakness because my flesh is weak. It has the tendency to, you know, to give into the uh, control or the dominating factor of sin. And I find myself, you know, uh, giving into uh, sin and the weakness of my flesh. So he's saying, you know, how do I find a way out of it or who can free me from it? And he says, you know, it is Jesus Christ. So it's the Holy Spirit that will uh, help you to overcome the weakness in the flesh. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, I got it. Yeah. So the law of God and the law of sin is not, the law here is not talking about the, the, the Old Testament laws. It's talking about the, the power, the control, or the dom dominion of uh, uh, sin, or the control, the power, and the dominion of God. That is what it's talking about when it's referring to law here. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, anyone else has any questions? OK, if there are no questions, so we'll move on to chapter 8. OK, we'll just uh, quickly read through chapters 8, and then maybe um, a few of you can share, you know, um, uh, some insights from chapter 8 that has blessed you, uh, you know, in your life, your journey with the God. Or if you're reading the chapter now, you know, something, uh, Rhema word that comes or some words that just leaps out at you, a word that sleeps out at you, you can share. Or uh, if you've had, um, you know, powerful encounter when uh, reading scripture, reading chapter 8 of Romans, you can also, um, you know, share with us. So we'll quickly just read Romans chapter 8. Uh, I hope we'll have time to um, share our thoughts on it. But um, uh, if a few of you can read uh, 
you know, four or five verses and we can get through Romans chapter 8. So can somebody please read Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8 verses 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh shed their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Thank you. Somebody else can read verses 6 to 10. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. Can somebody else read verses 11 to verse 15? Romans chapter 8 verses 11 to 15. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else likes to read um, verses 16 to me, verses 26, 10 verses? Anyone likes to read that, please? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth of pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, when we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. Okay, no problem, Zelotoli. Thank you. Okay, verses 27 to verse 39. Can somebody read that, please, for us? Anyone would like to read? Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So uh, we'll just have one or two minutes. Anyone likes to share something specific that you know you received while reading the scripture passage or uh, any favorite you know verse that you have here that's spoken to you in life, has helped you? Anything like you like to share, highlight? Anyone? Yeah, uh, I would like to highlight verse 18 where it says, uh, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be uh, revealed in us. I think uh, this verse always helps me to go through the hardest times in life. Uh, when I just when I just think like okay it's nothing <laughs> whatever I go through it, it's it's all nothing when I have got Christ and uh, I think that gives a great hope it just it just transforms mind in a second uh, just to focus on God just to focus on what He has did for us and what He's about to do for us just gets us out of this world, gets us to that uh, kingdom mindset, that citizenship that we are like, okay, no matter what happens, uh, it's God who is with us, his glory will be revealed in us. We should think in that spiritual mindset. And even the last verse does the same thing for us, that nothing can separate us from mm. the love of God. It also gives us that hope. Um, maybe especially when we feel guilty, I mean, in my life, when I ever felt guilty, I feel like oh, maybe I'm far away, maybe God is far away <laughs> or something. But then when I when I read this verse, I, I remember this verse always in my life. Then, okay, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And it's just beyond imagination. I think the love is just beyond imagination, beyond understanding, actually. But yeah, we are really blessed to know about him. Yes, thank you, Jeffina, for sharing. Anyone else? Anyone else likes to share? Now, the first verse where it talks about there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, I think sums up what we uh, spoke in chapter 6 and 7 and how um, God makes it easy for us to overcome the work of the enemy and uh, even the sin that is trying to dominate us um, and also encouraging us to walk in the spirit not according to the flesh and also submitting ourselves to uh, as an instrument of righteousness um, and even towards the end we see this uh, the same uh, theme being presented um, we are overcomers um, I think it was the end, the last section. Mm. Um, uh, what is that? Um, I'm persuaded You're that more than neither con- death. Yeah, yeah, we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. Yeah. Yes. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Talking about the assurance that we have through Christ Jesus that we can overcome the work uh, of the flesh, the work of the enemy, and we are more than conquerors. Yeah. Thank you, John Paul. Good to hear your voice after a long time, after many classes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. 
Yeah. So um, we'll stop here as, as time is up. I'd just like to say that we, uh, you know, um, uh, should have our first assessment on chapters one to four. So when would you like that? Can you please suggest a date sometime next week? Would you like it in the weekend or during the weekdays? Can you suggest a date and how many days do you want to have chapters one to four? Uh, the weekdays is better. <laughs> Weekend the weekdays is better? Yeah. Uh, and maybe four days we can have a Sunday. Four days? Okay. Two days. Four days. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is fine first. But uh, mostly in the week, weekdays is better, I think. So. What about if I give it to you on the 5th, that is next Thursday, and you submit it on Saturday? Is that to the sun, or you want it on the 4th and submit it on the 6th? Yeah, 4th and 6th. Saturday, we have a conference. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. 4th and 6th, is that fine? Yeah. All of you? Yes, first. Okay, so I'll uh, post it on the 4th, and you all can submit it on the 6th. Okay, thank you so much for joining class. Have a good weekend, everyone. A refreshing and a blessed uh, weekend. See you. I don't think we have class on Monday, right? This Monday is a holiday? Yes, first. October yes. 2nd. Okay, we meet yeah. uh, next Friday. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor.